Bullshit. Pretend for a moment we've entered a parallel universe free of bullshit and full of bold solutions. That's what the No BS Marketing Show is all about. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich. Our guest today is Don Marinelli, but first, let's cut the bullshit. Most people wonder about truth in advertising, and there's even a spoof on YouTube about the lack thereof. But what about truth in the reporting of news? From August to November 2016, fake stories earned more shares, reactions, and comments on Facebook than real news stories. A Pew Research Center poll found that 64% of Americans believe fake news is causing a great deal of confusion about the basic facts of current events. As Pew explained, fake news makes it harder for any of us to have a shared view of the facts. This concern transcends political parties. Roughly six in 10 Republicans and Democrats agree that fake news causes a great deal of confusion. Yet Americans say they're not fooled by fake news. 39% are very confident they can recognize news that's fabricated. An additional 45% feel somewhat confident. But an Ipsos poll for BuzzFeed found that 75% of Americans who recognized a fake news story from the election still viewed the story as accurate. Respondents were shown six headlines, three false and three true. If they recalled seeing the story before, they were asked if the headline was accurate. Respondents believed the fake headlines were, quote, somewhat or, quote, very accurate 75% of the time. One made-up story Donald Trump sent his own plane to transport 200 stranded Marines was viewed as accurate by 84% of respondents. A Stanford University study similarly found that Americans rarely recognize false stories or biased sources. What do we think needs done to fix this? 71% of Americans believe that sites like Facebook should take steps to stop fake news. Facebook obviously has an incredible impact on what we talk about with 1.8 1.8 billion monthly users, nearly half of American adults obtain their news from Facebook. Facebook recently announced they will partner with third-party fact-checkers to flag fake articles and alert users before they share fake news. A red warning sign reading, disputed by third-party fact-checkers, will display below fake stories. If a user tries to share that story, a similar warning pops up with a link to the fact-checker's article. Facebook will also rank disputed stories lower in news feed and will not allow disputed stories to be turned into ads and promoted. Meanwhile, Google has said it would prevent websites selling fake news from using its advertising network. These steps will surely help readers identify fake news and slow its spread. That's a good step to help us out, but we need to do some work ourselves, too. Let's take a little time to look beyond Facebook, Twitter, and other social media sites to gather content. Let's go just a little bit deeper than headlines and sound bites so we can gain more of an understanding of the real story. Yes, we all have biases, so every outlet will too, but it doesn't hurt to gather multiple points of view. And despite the backlash against the, quote, mainstream media, which, by the way, is a bullshit term that I'll address in another rant because there are mainstream outlets on both sides of the political aisle. But I digress. Despite the criticism of mainstream media, those outlets still adhere to fact checking and other longstanding journalistic practices. We all need to play our part in reducing the impact of fake news. Take the time to weed out the nonsense and cut the bullshit. The Nobia Show is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com slash nobs. Try a book like The Girl with the Lower Back Tattoo by Amy Schumer. You can download it for free today, audibletrial.com slash no BS. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash no BS for your free audiobook. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Our guest today is Don Marinelli, Director of Innovation for 535 Media Inven Global. Don is also the Academic Director of the Entertainment Technology Management MS Degree Program of Columbia University School of Professional Studies. For you Pittsburgh Pirates fans, he's also the guy you see dressed up in an impressive pirate costume during games. Don, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Army buckos. I already said to Mike (laughs) Gaddy when we were setting up, I said, this guy's voice is booming. I'm going to sound like I have no clue about how to deliver a message. Don, let's before we dig into the show, what do mm-hmm. you think of the cut the bullshit rant about fake news? 
you know, as you were saying it, I, I found myself realizing that fake news is really designed to tap into your existing biases and prejudices. I mean, it's it's really pablum, uh, hearing what you want to hear, and that's important because I'm I was trained in existentialism. I mean, I'm basically an existentialist, which means that you're somebody who's constantly questioning. Where, who am I? What am I? Where am I? Why am I doing what I'm I'm doing? Which is also why I'm an actor, because uh, an actor must constantly be asking uh, oneself those questions about the character. And you know, when you read an article that seems rather out there, you can either immediately fall back in, into the trap of saying yes, because I knew X, Y, or Z was a was a moron or what have you, or that's the way they would be, or it forces you to say, is that really true? Like, is that, in other words, it makes you work. And the problem, uh, the, I think the problem with most people is that fake news reinforces the bias and prejudice and, and they don't, they don't do the work that sits there and says, well, you know, even though I may like this person, even though I may agree with that, even though this is something I wish could have occurred, did it happen? And did it happen in those ways? And and likewise, I'm always one who believes that there's two sides to every story. So, I mean, e- even if it's positive to somebody that I like, I'm like, okay, what what's the potential negative? How can somebody see this as a negative? And uh, so that was my, re- my reaction to it. Because there's always been fake stories. It's called satire. It's Saturday Night Live. It's The Onion you know, where you where you take things to an extreme and what have you. And very often we laugh because it's a complete 180 from what we expect. Uh, you know, I used to tell my drama students, you, you think you learn most of what it means to be social and a person through tragedy. You don't. You learn most of it through comedy. Because comedy is, you know, being laughed at is one of the quickest ways that you'll, you will stop doing something. You know, you know, a, a comedy is very often about people who are trying to circumvent the system in odd ways. It's Ralph Cramden coming home and saying to Alice, I've got the idea. We're going to make a million dollars, Alice. Wow. You know, and, uh, <laughs> and and what you realize is, oh, yeah, it isn't that easy, Ralph. You have to, in America, you have to work hard. Yes. Blah, 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 blah. So, um, I mean, basically, fake news is fiction. It's basically fiction writing. It's fantasy. Uh, so I, I approach it, you know, as such. You have to take it as such. It scratches the surface of the bigger issue that you mentioned is that far too many of us take the reinforcing way out. Exactly. Because it is hard work to try to listen to multiple points of view. And people don't, like they have such short memories. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking politics, sports, religion, life. People just want to have it both ways. Like the people that were angry in January of 2009 are yelling at the people who were angry in January of 2017. And the fact of the matter is both things happen. <laughs> well, yeah, and we're seeing it right now. Like <laughs> the ones who hate Trump, good God. I mean, it's, it, it. I mean, the man can't exhale without it being some devious, demonic, Hitlerite intention which happened in 2009 that's the same thing people it, did to obama it's, it's both the, sides. That, both sides. the irrationality is what bothers me that, that that's exactly the case you know and you and you have to sit there saying okay um i mean i would think i was watching one of the news channels last night and they were talking about how now the dems the democrats are going to be obstructionists <laughs> to trump but i'm like well what the hell do you think the republicans exactly. were to Obama. Exactly. So if that seems to be the nature of the beast, we're talking about a very bizarre sort of checks and balance Mm -hmm. that's going on. And maybe, in fact, the American populace intrinsically senses that. And they're like, you know, we want a little bit of of, Mm -hmm. of balance here. Or, or, you know, I'm a royalist, all right? I I think the UK's got it right. And the fact that in parliament, it's Her Majesty's loyal opposition. You know, they disagree with what's in, but they are the loyal opposition. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the fact that the UK is able to separate the head of state from the head of government 
and the head of state is not a political figure because they realize government is a game. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a rather sick game where there's winners and losers, but there has to be something beyond that. And it's the crown. You know, it's the crown. Like, the queen's got a cold. I've got a cold. I feel very bad. You know, I'm like, oh, she's okay. Uh, so that that's my rantings on, on that. I hear you. So, Don Marinelli, you I mentioned to you about the pirates uh, when you dress up as a pirate. I want to get into that at some point in the show. But let's start by having you walk us through your educational background, your sure. career journey to date. Well, when I was young, all I wanted to be was an actor. And I wanted to be an actor... I didn't realize it, but I wanted to be an actor because by playing the roles of other people, trying to figure out why these characters did what they did in these situations, it was a way of trying to figure out who am I? I mean, who who, who am I? Why am I here? What am I doing? And all that. And and it was also, frankly, a way to get out of the house because I grew up in a classic Italian-American family where, you know, we had to be fighting 24 hours a day and... Uh, uh, I mean, I just wanted out. And the great thing about theater was you had to rehearse, which meant you had to like show up in the evening, get out of the house and rehearse. And so I used to tell my students, I said, uh, if you really think that my desire for theater was promoted by the deep philosophical and all that, well, partly. The other thing was I got out of the house and uh, I got to wear really cool clothes and tights sometimes. And at that time, you know, the women in theater were the were the, the they were the quickest women in the world. It was like, yeah, right on. I, I love this. But acting was all I wanted to do. So I I went to school. I got the dual degree in speech and drama and psychology, because frankly, there is no difference in my uh, estimation between psychology and acting, in terms of uh, what an actor does trying to understand a character. And I got to Pittsburgh, in fact, because of those two, I realized that psychology probably had a better health plan and uh, greater assurance of a paycheck. So I came to Duquesne University uh, from Tampa, which is where I was living. And I came to Duquesne because they had an existential phenomenological psychology program. Uh, and, and that I found that really cool. In fact, even now, a lot of people don't understand the degree. And when I'm introduced, they'll say, I have a degree in extra sensual phenomenology, to which I reply, <laughs> one, if only, and two, I'm not sure I want a degree in extra sensual anything from a Catholic school. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so I got my master's in, in clinical psychology, but found myself constantly going to the old Nixon Theater in downtown Pittsburgh to see performances because the more I studied psychology, the more I related it back to what an actor does. And then finally, I thought, you know what, maybe I, maybe theater is where I belong. So what I did was I applied to the PhD program in theater at the University of Pittsburgh, and I got in. And my mentors there were Dr. Attilio Favorini, Buck Favorini, who started the Shakespeare Festival, and Dr. Leon Katz, who had been at Carnegie Mellon for many, many years. And I got my doctorate in theater, history, uh, literature, and criticism with a dissertation on an Italian guy named Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, who was the founder of Italian Futurism which in the early 20th century, 1909, was the first art movement to embrace technology as the pinnacle of artistic accomplishment. This is significant because my first job after my degree was at Carnegie Mellon University Drama, the oldest school of drama in the country. And it, it, was, it was bliss. For 15 years, I was the associate department head. I would go to Hollywood for parties, New York for Broadway openings, being surrounded by some of the most talented people. But in the mid-90s, everything changed. And it changed when I was on an audition tour. And I basically was the stand-up comedian to keep everybody occupied while we did the auditions. And I don't remember what city it was in, but there was a large crowd out there. And I said, let's do a little, let's play a game. It's Friday night. Money is no object. How many of you on your own volition will go see live theater? And I was stunned when less than half the hands went up. Then I said, whoa, how many of you would go see cinema? And more hands went up. Then I asked the real question. 
How many of you would prefer to order a couple of supreme uh, supreme pizzas from Domino's, get a case of beer, and sit at home in your living room playing video games? And practically every hand went up. And I came back to the faculty and I said, there's a revolution going on that is flying beneath our radar right now. Uh, it's called video games. And the fact of the matter is, if we get in now, we could probably have a significant role in shaping this industry. Uh, and they wouldn't hear anything about it. They, they wanted nothing to do with this. And I reminded them that the last time we had a technological revolution uh, that affected our industry, it was called television. And we didn't want anything to do with television because theater was the pure art. I, and I said, and look what happened to TV. It, it transformed into a genuine art form, highly productive, creative, and lucrative. I said, the same thing is going to happen with video games. They didn't want any part of it. So I, I resigned from the School of Drama, walked across the campus to the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon, and asked them if there was any room in their, in their sandbox for a drama professor, and was stupefied when they said, welcome. We would love to have you here. And that's what led me from drama to the School of Computer Science. What really astounded me was a few years later, Randy Pausch, my partner in, in the creation of the Entertainment Technology Center, he invited me to a uh, DARPA conference. DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Administration. Like It's sort of like the CIA of the DOD. You know, They got mm -hmm. all this money. They can do cool things. And I was at a DARPA conference in Orlando. And I was there for three days and, and, and was starting to have an existential crisis because they were talking real geek speak. And I wasn't sure what was going on. I was really starting to question, am I in the right place? When all of a sudden the admiral, the general, whoever it was said, ladies and gentlemen, we've had a very special guest with us for the last few days. He's a drama professor. And I got all excited. I started looking around the room thinking, oh, I'm not the only one. And then he goes, Dr. Marinelli, would you please come down front? <laughs> So, my goodness, I get up, I go down front, and the admiral says, um, you're the only drama professor we're aware of who's in a school of computer science. Uh, what impact has this had on you? And without even flinching, I said, I feel right at home. And the audience broke out into a murmur like, oh, this poor man has lost his mind. <laughs> and I said to them, you know what? I just had a, an epiphany. I realize that I know more about what you do than you know about what I do. I said, you really believe we drama people get up in the morning, we put on our togas, we walk out into the forest, we lift our hands to the heavens and we go, oh, muses, please strike me with inspiration. I said, we don't do that. We do exactly what you do. What, what do you do in computer science? You put together algorithms. Algorithms are, are essentially if-then equations. If these circumstances are met, if these parameters are met, if these values are met, then this will occur. I said, what do you think we do in drama or psychology? I said, we put together if-then equations. If this is the mindset of the character and the situation that the character is confronting, then odds are pretty good he or she is going to act in this way. When I'm directing a play and I direct the actors, that's what I'm working on. I said, the difference is with an algorithm, you're dealing with math, which is very finite and definite. What I'm dealing with is human psychology. So the closest I can get to an algorithm is a heuristic. In other words, heuristic means it's pretty likely this will happen, but you never know. I said, so we're basically doing the same thing, which is why I feel at home. The difference is these kids never go outside, which is why when I walked into the School of Computer Science, I thought I, I was in like a lab, you know, with, with kids who hadn't been outside in so long, their skin had become translucent. You know, that, that's about the only difference. And that's why I felt right at home. And when the Entertainment Technology Center started and Randy and I were put together, it was a natural mating. I mean, it, and, and it led to creation of a wonderful center, which is still alive and well at CMU. So I'm with Don Marinelli, great background, great stories. I want to touch on something because I think it's valuable to our listeners who are out there. Some maybe are in this position where they've got to make a move. 
you were in the School of Drama and you said you walked across campus to the School of Computer Science. They opened their arms and took you in. And you said, you know, I resigned from the School of Drama, but walk me through that. Were you able to maintain your tenure status and your employee status? And you did you go to each respective dean? How did you do this? this I remained a, change? basically I was a drama professor on loan to the School of Computer Science because my tenure was within the School of Drama. And in the early years of the Entertainment Technology Center, my salary line remained in the School of Drama, except the pay would come from the Entertainment Technology Center. We had our own account and all that. Uh, the Entertainment Technology Center does not have tenure track positions. So my tenure was with the School of Drama. But, you know, I did 15 years in drama and then 16 years basically on loan to computer science and then working with Randy in the Entertainment Technology Center. And then when he he left at the end of 05, and then I ran it solo from 06 until 12 when I resigned. And um, I mean, by then I was really, eat, I was really Entertainment Technology Center, but I think I was always part of drama. I was just on loan. And the way the center works is it answered directly to the provost now it answers to the dean. Uh, in fact, I, I, I actually don't know how it, it, it works now. But early on, interestingly enough, we did answer to the two deans, the dean of the School of Fine Arts and the dean of the School of Computer Science, until I realized you, you cannot be the servant of two masters and went to the provost and said, get them out of the way. Let us answer directly to you. Because what we're trying is so daring, so experimental, and we promise you that if it doesn't work, we'll kill it. I said, because if there's any industry that has no problem killing a project, it's showbiz. Uh, and fortunately, it was very successful and uh, is alive and well. Talk about Randy and your relationship there in the <clears throat> last lecture, since he's such a notable figure and impactful. Talk about how you two met and how that turned into a well, great Randy partnership. and I, we were a shotgun wedding. I mean, it was uh, uh, Jim Morris, who was the dean of the School of Computer Science, and, and Jerry Cohen, the president of Carnegie Mellon at the time, when the university realized that this skunk works of a drama guy and a geek was had legs to it and was going to evolve into a degree-granting program, they realized that the number of people who could do this on their own were folks like, oh, Steve Jobs, you know, John Lasseter from Pixar. And the odds of them uh, uh, pulling up stakes and moving to Pittsburgh were like zero to none. So um, they knew that they needed uh, somebody from each department. So I became the the uh, artsy fartsy guy and Randy was the geek because Randy had come back from Virginia and had his course, which was building virtual worlds. And basically... The Entertainment Technology Center was a was an extrapolation of the building virtual worlds where students came together were from different disciplines and they had very short time periods, two weeks to 10 days and different technologies and they had to create an immersive experience. And we, we blew that out into the Entertainment Technology Center, which is project based and all that. When Randy and I were first introduced to each other, People were taking bets as to which one of us would be found floating face down in the river first because we were two alpha males. And the great story about Randy and I is that we were alpha males. We, we, we ran what we did. You know, I was uh, – my email at Carnegie Mellon was the Don, you know, and Randy was this, you know, rather overt – handsome, good looking American. I kept saying Randy was looked like what I thought I was going to look like when I grew up. And instead <laughs> I, I ended up looking like Lou Costello. Mm -hmm. um, and we sat down and realized that the only way we were going to make this thing work was by professing our ignorance. And I remember saying to him, Randy, I've been hanging around computer science for two years and I still don't know what you guys do. All I know is it involves zeros and ones, and I still don't get it. Teach me. And he said, Don, I've been dabbling in the arts for many years, but I have to tell you, I don't know what you drama people do. All I know is it involves a lot of hugging and kissing. And so if you promise not to hug and kiss me, we should get along. And I said, you have no worries about that. And 
we spent six years, our desks were next to each other, and every day was a learning experience. Some kid would come in with a computer science question, the kid would leave, and I would go, okay, Randy, what is an infinite loop? I said, I think I was on one in 1969, <laughs> uh, but what do you mean when you say infinite loop? And he'd go, oh, in computer science. Then a kid would come in with some question about a story or a character. The kid would leave and Randy would go, okay, you were criticizing him for playing the subtext. What does playing the subtext mean? And I'd go, oh, okay. Playing the subtext at sinful. Let me tell you why. And that's that's how we basically educated each other. And let me tell you, when I when I was a young professor, the words of advice I got were almost along the lines of the fake news that you were talking mm-hmm, about. Mm-hmm. I remember seasons, you know, weathered professors, corduroy jackets, leather, leather patches going. Don, remember, you just need to read one chapter ahead of the students. And I remember thinking, well, that sounds like a survival technique, but it also sounds like, frankly, bullshit. And I remember a professor of mine in the University of Tampa who was a good teacher, and one day he looked like his dog died. And I said, you know, Professor so-and-so, why are you you so sad? And he goes, I just got my PhD. I said, well, why does that make you sad? And he goes, because in this world, with a PhD, people will think I know everything. And he said, I've never felt dumber. Like I'm just at the beginning of learning about something. And and now that I'm involved for the last 20 years now in digital media, it is freeing to walk into a classroom of a bunch of 17-year-olds who have grown up as digital natives. They've played games. They know interactive media. They know the apps. And I can look at them and say, I have a confession to make. I'm the dumbest guy in the room when it comes to what we're here to study. You know more about this, about these games and everything than I do. I just happen to know more about everything else. So this is going to be a mutual learning experience because I'm here to drain your brain for you to tell me why this game is better than that, why this functionality is better than this, why this capability now opens a whole new vista for you. And I'm going to teach you how not to get arrested, how to start saving money, how to prepare for adulthood, how to be ready for the heartbreaks in your life. So we're going to become partners here. And that has been the most freeing, wonderful experience for a teacher that I've ever had. That's Don Marinelli. You've been listening to the No Bullshit Marketing Show. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich. You'll hear more of my interview with Don on part two 